So now I've processed a number of last tiles uh, using the building object extractor tool here, the step one that we discussed about earlier. And we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the results. How long does this take? Uh, there's not a real good definitive answer on this. It all depends on the complexity of the uh, last data. Uh, if you have a flat area with very few buildings, it could take a couple of minutes to process. If you've got an area with a whole bunch of trees and buildings, it could take, you know, I don't know, up to an hour. Uh, I processed uh, 32 tiles over this area. Um, you can kind of see the level of complexity that you see here with the buildings and the, the trees and everything. And it took approximately about uh, 10 uh, minutes per tile. These are square mile tiles. So again, it could just kind of very, I would highly suggest that you go through and do a, a triage through uh, all your last tiles, maybe with an photo as a backdrop, and figure out which tiles you don't need. Uh, so that'll just cut down the amount of time devoted to this thing. So just pull out the, the tiles that seem to have buildings in it and go from there. So we're going to take this now and take a look at some of the data products that were developed after the finish of, of step one. First thing that happened was uh, a as we talked about before, it creates these last data sets. Again, these are an Esri product that uh, likes to house the um, um, the last data files here. Uh, this is just about four different tiles. Uh, they kind of intersect right about here in this area. Um, and again, they have all sorts of different kinds of information, the elevation, returns, all sorts of things. It's not a... Uh, LiDAR last uh, training video here. We're just talking about the building tool, so I won't go through all that. But these are last data sets, so you can take these and do other kinds of processing. Uh, but right now, uh, what I've got here is actually the, the point cloud express uh, according to their classification. And everything, all the points that are classified as brown or the, this brown color here, and everything, all the points that are unclassified are gray, and then like no areas are kind of white here. So it kind of shows you you know, what we're dealing with here. Basically, we're going to be sorting out everything that's in the gray and, and dealing with that. So that's the uh, last data sets. Then with those last data sets, as we talked about, we create um, these height DSMs. Again, we first create a, an elevation DSM based on the unclassified last return. And then we subtract that out from the uh, regular bare earth DEM to get these height DSMs. Again, these are heights above ground in whatever elevation units you're using. In this case, it was meters, but can be feet. And also at the very end, we, we said that, you know, we want to kind of threshold out all the, the little clutter like shrubs and other things. So we said everything two meters and above we're going to keep, we're going to turn off everything else. So here you see uh, the data set here with uh, all the different, uh, what was brought through in the very end. I'll turn off the background so you have a better idea. You can kind of see that, you know, very obvious where all the buildings are here, but there's also an awful lot of clutter from the vegetation and a few other things here. So this is the height DSM. Again, you can use this in the future for other kinds of products, but you've got this there. And then at the very end, you create these image segmentation products. Again, I'll throw the, uh, DLQ in the background again, just to kind of um, compare um, what was underneath there. If that's a little too busy, I'll turn it back off again. But uh, so each of these are individual objects. And so this, as I was explained before, it's like a polygon, but these are rasters. So, but apparently if you um, pick anywhere along here, it'll say, okay, this is one polygon, that's a raster. And then you pick here, this will be another separate one. Each of these have a separate class code to them. So that way you can sort out this versus all these other little classes here, which are now you know, obviously vegetation. So that's basically what we're, um, the end product of the last uh, step was to develop these raster objects. But we did one more thing here with the tool. Um, we um, went ahead and collected the roof height variability. If you t take a look at the uh, roofs, they tend to have very little variability as you move along from you know, one side to the other. And they may either increase or decrease or stay flat, but there's just not a whole lot of overall variability. Whereas again, if you and you see that here, where the low variability, or in this case, low standard deviation values are being displayed in brown. 
or orange, these colors there. But high variability or high standard deviation values in this case are being displayed in greens and blues. And again, this is what you would expect. Canopy has all sorts of different kinds of height values, so it has a, it's a high varied uh, standard deviation in, in height each of these um, class objects would have. So you're, you're seeing this, so this, again, this color range from uh, the, the oranges and browns being the, the lowest uh, value to these greens and blues being the highest value. And I can pick on one here and kind of show you. Okay, this has a pixel value, which is a standard deviation value of 0.748. Uh, um, for, and that's for this whole roof area here. Now if I were to pick over into like a, a tree area here, oh, pick over here, it has a value of 3.53. So you can kind of see that, uh, again, in general, not always the case, there's always exceptions, uh, because elsewise it would just be too easy. But um, everything or things that have high standard deviation tend to be trees or other kinds of vegetation, and things with low standard deviation, standard deviations tend to be roofs. So we're going to use this in the next uh, tool here to help uh, filter out the vegetation then. But just to show you that. Now what you can do again, as I said, you can go into the arc symbology and color code these to help maybe parse out, you know, what you know, get some some idea of what some sort of threshold there is between vegetation and buildings, or again you can use the, the identity tool and, and take a look and see what you're getting that way too. Um, but what we have generally found is that uh, when we uh, have done this in the past, uh, values, uh, standard deviation values of 1.5 and higher tend to be more trees. Less than 1.5 tends to be buildings. Um, again, there still be some vegetation on the either on the the lower side and buildings on the higher side, but that tends to be kind of a good line to um, filter these things out. Again, if you're having problems with too many buildings being put uh, uh, massed out or too, many, too much vegetation being uh, pulled through, this would be a place for you to maybe take a look at and, and see if you want to use that, use the standard deviation to, to work. Now, as I said before, we have uh, two steps here, the standard, de standard deviation building filter or the standard deviation and NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index building filter. These are two different building filters. The end products of these are going to be your actual building footprints. but um, the reason we have two of these is because if you just have the LiDAR data to work with, then you, you'll want to go to step 2A, and this uses the information that is inherent within the um, LiDAR data set. Now, if you're lucky enough to have like a air photo or some other imagery that was acquired at about the same time as the LiDAR data and at about the same spatial resolution, and it has a near infrared and a red bandwidth, then you could create a normal de normalized difference vegetation index. This is a, a image which bas basically enhances uh, uh, vegetative vigor. And um, we'll go a little bit into that. But if you don't have a, an image of the same time, same resolution, that has a in, uh, near infrared and the red, then um, you're, you, the only step you can go to is this next step here, step 2A. So we'll go into that right now. Discuss step 2B um, later here. So step 2A, the standard deviation building filter, it works very similar to what we've seen before. Input directory, again, this is going to be in your that output file. It's going to take that uh, these objects here and go ahead and filter these objects. So you want to point this towards your output file. And actually, you need to go in the output file to the timestamp file. Now, common error here, which I've done enough times, is it'll go, you know, I'll point to the output file and say, I, I can't find any data, and that's just because I need to go needed to go inside the output file to the timestamp file and say, that's where the data lie. And then create an output directory. Again, you could use the output directory from before, but I and we do have a timestamp file, so there shouldn't be any confusion. But I always kind of like to keep things separate just to make sure that I know where the problems may exist here. So I would highly suggest creating a whole new output file for this. And again, what this will result in is the output directory will house the actual building footprints. The threshold here that you see here is what we were talking about before, the standard deviation threshold. So values, of, in this case, above 1.5 will be turned into no data, considered vegetation, and, and turned off. Everything below that will be considered buildings and kept there.
footprint size threshold. This is another way that we use to help uh, sort out all of the clutter here. And again, the idea that these buildings should be at least a certain size. In this case, we've got we're generally using UTM meters, so we we've chosen uh, 32 square meters as kind of our minimum size footprint. Everything bigger than that will be kept. Anything smaller than that would be considered more noise, uh, you know, a little still more vegetation, another vegetation filter, or maybe large trucks and things like that. So it gets rid of some of that information there. If it's uh, if you have state plain feed, again, you'll have to convert this to uh, something that you're more willing to use, like 300 square feet or 400 square feet or whatever you want to use to help uh, pull out your buildings there. This actually also goes through another image segmentation process uh, to help uh, filter out uh, this data sets uh, uh, based on the standard deviation values. This image segmentation, again, works like the previous one. And uh, again, if you looked at your data file before and you're finding that uh, you had perfectly good objects and now they're getting all tossed out, this may be a place for you to play with. Um, the idea that if you're having far too many objects, you, you want to push down the, the values, you're having not enough objects, you can push up there. Again, we always have the minimum segment size. As I said before, this works very much like what happened in step one. The last thing here, and this is another little neat odd feature that ARC has, which has uh, been really nice. Um, what you end up with the, in the final results here is you'll end up with polygons that are based off of rasterized objects. And the problem with the rasterized objects is you'll end up with all these jagged edges, which uh, when you look up close kind of are fairly annoying. So uh, Esri in, in has this regular, regularized building footprint, which is a way to kind of shear off the, the jagged edges and clean up little holes and things that are found uh, throughout uh, the, the object there. Now there's, um, it has several different uh, variables to choose from. We have as default uh, right angles. This is really good for kind of doing perpendicular long straight edges. Uh, if you're, just definitely if you have uh, buildings that are east, west, north, south gridded, uh, this is a, a great tool to use that way. As in the case that I have here, I do have problems. The fact that a lot of my buildings are all sorts of odd shapes and definitely rarely on a north-south, east-west grid. So I, I end up with a few more problems because of that. But even with that, the right angle seems to work fairly nicely. If you're having issues and you really don't like the output there, you go to right angles and diagonals. This kind of compensates for allowing a lot more diagonal edges than just straight right angles. I've not been too happy with the products on those things, but you can see if that works better for you. Any angle just uh, doesn't enforce any kind of perpendicular perpendicularity. And uh, again, you've really got odd shaped buildings, but I've, again, I've not been very happy with the output on those things. So that's, uh, I tend to stay in the right angles. Again, a problem with the right, right angles, if you don't have a straight east, west, north, south, you have something diagonal, it'll start making um, little jagged, uh, it'll try to enforce perpendicularity to that. And you end up with uh, like these little stair step edges, which you can play around with and see if you can deal with or not deal with there. Another issue, they also have a circle uh, variable here. If what you find with the right angle uh, uh, method is that it'll turn any kind of uh, round feature like a tank or water tank or some other kind of uh, round object into something that looks like a first aid cross with um, uh, you know kind of a squared off a circle version. If you have a lot of circles, um, you may want to use this, you, like you're going over a tank farm or some other th area with a lot of round things. Elsewise, I always I suggest right angles. And then the last two uh, variables, the tolerance and intensification, are you know, primarily used by right angles, uh, but also some of the other methods. And this is a way to tell it, you know, at what point uh, do you start looking for another bend in the uh, the angle, or do you, well, how, how far do you enforce a, a right angle or perpendicularity to this? And at what point do you get rid of some of the holes that are kind of along the edges and in interior in the, the object here? These are done in the spatial units of, uh, of whatever your horizontal uh, uh, system is. Uh, again, we have 
in this case, uh, meters. So these are saying it's looking for anything greater than two meters or anything that, that it'll start doing imposing different kinds of uh, angles on. Anything less, it'll try to keep it straight or get rid of holes. After you fill that all in, you can um, set OK and send it off there.